Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today I'll solve the problem kth smallest in lexicographical order. So similar to yesterday's problem, and before we get started, I want to mention that while this problem can be solved with the same solution from yesterday's problem, that's going to be a linear time algorithm. And there is a more efficient approach, which is roughly a log base 10 of n squared solution, actually. So it is definitely much more efficient than this one. And it's honestly, in my opinion, not that difficult to understand. It's definitely difficult to come up with. But when you draw out the picture like I'm going to, it actually makes a lot of sense. So let's get into it. Let's consider this example. Let's say n is... 1361 and k is 400. There's a range of numbers from 1 to n, which is this, and those numbers are sorted lexicographically. So not by like 1, 2, 3, but based on like the digit. So we'd have something like this. Actually, within this range, we'd probably have that and then this, and then I think 1001. So basically, it's the same way strings are sorted. Like imagine that this was a string rather than a number. Now, to kind of enumerate all of these, we can make a tree that looks like this. We have initially nine choices, something like this. I'm not obviously going to draw all of these. And then from here, this is kind of the prefix. So now all the children here are going to be all of the numbers that start with a one. Well, particularly this level is going to include two digit numbers since this is a one digit number. So we'll have 10, 11, all the way up until 19. Now, remember that this is a range of 10 numbers. This was nine, but we keep going. So from here, we can then go to 100, 101, et cetera, et cetera, 109. Notice that the pattern is that this was the prefix. Every single one of these numbers has the same prefix, but the next digit is an added digit, and it'll be from 0 to 9, so 10 different digits. Now, we could traverse through this tree because what we want to do is in this order, we want to get the kth smallest number. So we could do this DFS kind of like what we did yesterday. And once we get to the 400th number, so this is the first number, this is the second number, and then this is the third number. And then we'd you know eventually pop back up and keep going. Eventually, we'd get to the 400th number, whatever it is, that's what we would return. Clearly, in the worst case, this is going to be an O of K algorithm. I guess you could say O of N as well in the worst case. I mean, it depends on the K value. Now, the only possible way that we could optimize this is if we knew somehow from here, we knew among these choices, which one of them actually has the result, which one actually has the 400th number. Well, how could you possibly know that? Well, potentially we could check for this guy, how many children does it have that are less than or equal to this? How many numbers start with a one that fall within the range? How many are there? And if that number is less than or equal to 400, including this one, I guess, then we should probably search this side. Now, if not, we just saved ourselves a lot of work. We can then ask the same question for this. Like we don't have to go through that entire tree. We kind of eliminated that entire tree. And then we'd ask the same question here. Well, we just eliminated four or however many choices. Like if let's say there were 300 choices here, we eliminate all of them. We can decrement that from K and then we can say, OK, well, now we're looking for the hundredth smallest number starting from this number. And then going to the children, we'd ask the same question. How many values are here? And suppose, let's say there's 200 values that are less than or equal to that range, which I don't think there are, but I'm just making this up. Well, then we would know, OK, well, the number is somewhere here. And so by doing it this way, we are going through the entire level in the worst case. So that's 10. That's a constant, not a big deal. But in this case, if that's what we're doing for every single level, like now two is going to have 10 children. And then we're going to ask the same question for here, like which one of these 10 children do we actually want to go down? So you can see that the time complexity of this solution is going to be determined by the number of levels in the tree, like whatever level the kth value is on. That's the time complexity. So 10 times log base 10 of n. Now, that's assuming that we can determine how many values there are along a path. 
in constant time. But it's actually not possible to do that in constant time. But the algorithm I'm going to show you, like that's the whole complicated part of this, like figuring out how exactly to do that. And that algorithm runs roughly in log base 10 of n time. So just by seeing the time complexity, you can kind of imagine how we're going to do it. It's also going to be determined by going down levels. Then you could take this and multiply it by that. Now you kind of see how I'm getting the log squared. And I think there'd also be another constant in here, maybe 10. And then, you know, that doesn't really make a big deal. So now let's figure out how exactly we can do that with a concrete example. We're going to start at one. That's always going to be the lexicographically smallest number in the range from one to N. I could have a separate pointer, which tells us what position we're at. Let's call it I, I equals one. We're looking for position 400. I could do that. But when I actually code this up, I'm just going to decrement K because it's easier. It's more concise to do it that way. But I think for visualization, it might make more sense to say, okay, right now we're at the first number. We want to be at the 400th number. So basically while I is less than K, we're going to continue our algorithm. Okay, so now we're at this point. We want to know how many values belong to this entire thing, including this value. There's a couple of ways you could actually think about this. One that I initially came up with was thinking of how to calculate just the children of this node. And while that works, the code ends up a bit more verbose than the other solution. So I'll kind of show you the more elegant one. It's to think of it in this way. We're here right now. So if we're at one and we need to get to 400, you could say that we need to take 399 steps. We need to take like that many steps in our DFS traversal. So that's one step, another step, et cetera, et cetera. Now, suppose that this entire tree has, including this one, 399 values. That would mean that starting from here, if we take 399 steps, we're going to actually end up at this value. Why is that? Because this is one value and then we have 398 children. So for us to jump to the last child, it would take 398 steps. On the 399th step, we'd be done with this entire tree and then we would land on this guy. So thus, one elegant way to calculate this is to say, well, if the total number of values in this entire tree, if I take that, add it to my current position, if that's less than or equal to K, then the solution is not within this subtree. Let me repeat that because this is the most important part. If it's exactly equal, like we kind of showed that example, one plus 399, that would mean that this is the target. So I think that makes sense. Now, what if this was less? What if this was instead of 399, it was 300? That tells us that there's only 300 in this entire tree. Thus, the 400th number can't possibly be in that tree, right? So that would mean that, well, we just eliminated 300 candidates and now we're going to go here. We took 300 jumps and now we're here. Now, if it was greater, suppose the total number of nodes in here was actually exactly 400 or maybe even 450, then it's obvious that the 400th value in lexicographical order is going to be in this subtree. And so in that case, we would go down a level, which would basically take this number and multiply it by 10. So we know that this guy has 10 different children, 10 all the way up until 19. So really, there's two choices. Either we go down, so here, or we move to the right over here. If we move down, we clearly eliminated everything over here in the tree. If we move to the right, we eliminated this tree. So now we understand that. Now, if you know that, you pretty much know most of the problem, but we just need to figure out that helper function. How exactly do we calculate the number of nodes in that particular subtree? Well, let's try to visualize it. We're going to do this level by level. So we know that this guy, I'm not going to draw all of them, so it's going to go from 10 to 19. We know this is 20. We want to count everything in this tree so we can start kind of at the first level. It's always going to be a difference of one here. Like for this guy, we either want to keep going or we want to move to the right. The right neighbor is always just going to be a plus one from here. I think that makes sense. At the very least, this tree will have one value. So we take the difference between these two, two minus one, we get a one. Great. Now we want to know how many are in the next level. So we take this and multiply it by 10. So we get the smallest value in its level. Now from here, you might just think, well, okay, well, this level is going to have 10 and technically it will. 
and then we'll go to the next level. We'll go to 100. And this level is actually going to have 100 because consider this, like this will go all the way up until 109, but this one will have some children as well, 190, all the way up until 199. And everything in this range is basically all of the numbers that start with a one that have three digits and there are 100 of them. And the next level will be 1000. There's many ways to calculate this. The elegant way is like this. We could actually take the other value, like we originally started here and here, we could take this guy and also be multiplying it by 10. Because notice something here, this is going to be 20. And then down here, this is going to be 200. And so this way, we can just constantly take this value and this value and compute the difference, which on this level will give us 10. Here it gave us 1. On this, it's going to give us 200 minus 100. That's 100. This is a pretty nice, elegant way. But the main reason we're actually doing it this way is because at some point we might actually not want to include every single value on a particular level. And that's about to happen right now. So now we're going to get to the interesting part. We go here, it's going to be a thousand and up until a thousand and nine. Here, we're going to go to 1990 up until 1999. But Notice something. This is 2000. We're going to try to do 2000 minus 1000. So we're saying that there's a thousand values on this level. I mean, technically that's possible, but our maximum value is 1361. So most of these are actually going to be invalid. In this particular case, rather than using 2000, we'd rather use 1361. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. So down here, I'm actually going to put 1361. Let's just do the calculation to see how it would work right now. On this level, how many can we include in this range? And remember that this value is inclusive. So right now we would do 1361 minus 1000. That's going to give us 361. So what does that mean? That there's only 361 values in this range that are less than or equal to this number? What would that mean? That would mean, well, from 1000 up until 1360, because I mean, this counts. We're not starting from one. We're starting from zero. So this is that range. But no, we're actually allowed to have 1361 as well. So basically what I'm getting at, that's like a long explanation for saying that we're not actually going to take this number, subtract it by that. We're actually going to take that number plus one and subtract it by that because that value is inclusive. Okay, so we did it. And so now on this level, we're going to say there are 362. The plus one comes from the reason I just kind of talked about. So, okay, and now we're done because now we're going to take this number, multiply it by a thousand, and we're going to get to 10,000. And we're going to see that, okay, this number, the prefix, is already greater than n. So at this point, we can stop. So, how many did we count? In this subtree, there are 1 plus 10 plus 100 plus 362. Long story short, that is greater than k. So there are enough numbers here for us to have the 400th number. So we are going to go down this path. We're going to go to 10 now. And I'll quickly just go through a little bit of this. So if we were here, that was the first number in lexicographical order. And we're taking this and going here, multiplying it by 10. That's a jump of one. So our I can say that we're now at the second position. But just because we're here doesn't mean that we're actually going to go down this path. Now here, we're going to make the same choice. Should we go down here or should we go to its right neighbor, which would be 11? So let me kind of illustrate that a little bit. So right now, I is at position two. Alternatively, you could decrement K. Um, but now, same question. How many values does this subtree have? Well, we'll take 11 minus 10. That's going to give us one. We'll multiply this by 10, we'll get 100, and then we'll get 110. Take the difference of these two, we will get 10. Same thing, 1,000 and this, which is that. How many numbers are like here in this side of the tree? Take these two numbers, take the difference between them. The reason we're still using this number is because this number is still less than or equal to that. If this number ever becomes greater than or equal to that, at that point, we can probably break out of the loop. But the more important thing is that you use this number in that case. Well, this number plus one. So here, this is 100, as you'd expect. And now down here, we're going to get to 10,000. And since that's bigger than n, we can kind of stop now. So we counted this many numbers that start with a 10. That would have been in this tree. And if you don't believe me, those numbers are 10. And then 100 through 109. 
and then like a hundred of those values where we're gonna go from like a thousand up until a thousand and nine and then we do the same thing I think from 10 to 10 19 etc etc so those would be like the hundred category but long story short this is 111 so if you take that and add it to our i position we are going to be less than k so we know that the solution is actually not down this path and we are going to now try this path and i don't believe the solution is going to be there either then we would try like 12 and we kind of keep going to the right until we found the one that had the correct like case element and then we'd start going down now last question you might have is well what if we get to the last position well first of all if we did get to the last position we'd pretty much know for sure that the child is down there because we can't really move further to the right but those computations i believe will still work out because if we have nine and we have 10 take the difference of those it's going to be one take 90 take 100 take the difference of those that's going to be a 10 as you'd expect we'll get to 900 and a thousand take the difference it'll be 100 so i do believe the math will be consistent in that case while this might be like an understandable solution it's definitely not easy to come up with and to be honest now that i'm kind of going through it i can see why this is a hard problem it's actually not that easy to understand so let's code this up and i actually changed my mind given the fact that i was explaining this in terms of having like an eye pointer i guess i'll just kind of use that just to be consistent so we're starting at one that's like our smallest number and the position of that element is index one we want to get our eye pointer to be k and at that point we'll return the current number so let's just put that down here so now we're going to say while i of course is less than k let's keep going so what do we want to do either we want to move down or we want to move to the right so let's assume we have a helper function that i'm going to call count and let's say given the current position it's going to give us the count of that entire subtree including the element itself because that's going to tell us how many steps that we'll have to move to be to the right position so if we wanted to move to current uh, equals current plus one if we wanted to move to the right this is how many steps we would have to take now if after taking that many steps so i plus steps were still less than k or were exactly equal to k that would mean that current plus one is the solution in either of those cases we want to move to the right because either current doesn't have enough children well yeah that, that pretty much just means current just doesn't have enough children the kth element is not going to be on that subtree so we move to the right otherwise it does have enough and therefore we want to move down the way to move down is to take current and multiply it by 10. now we also want to keep track of our current position if we multiply by 10 that's actually the easiest case in our dfs case that's just taking one step so we can take our i pointer increment it by one if we move to the right we have to take this many steps to do that so that's exactly what we're going to do increment i by the number of steps now for actually computing the count which isn't super crazy but I would say it's probably the hardest part of the problem. So let's do that. Give count and let's say current and let's compute the number of steps. So I'm gonna call that result and that's what we're gonna return. And so we want its right neighbor, the current's neighbor. So I'm just gonna call it that, let's say neighbor, and I'm gonna say current plus one. That's initially what's the case. And so remember, we wanna keep going while our current is less than or equal to the end value that's up there. So while that's the case to the result, you could say we want to add to it the neighbor minus cur. And then each time we want to take cur and move down a level. So multiply it by 10 and do the same thing with the neighbor. Multiply it by 10. The only catch is what if the neighbor is actually greater than n then we'd be counting too many so one way to do this is to say well neighbor could be equal to the minimum of itself and n but not just n we want to do n plus one for reasons i talked about it makes the calculation work out so this will work obviously you could take this and just substitute it here and do that and then you can get rid of this line so there you go this is the entire solution and it's definitely not easy this is a hard problem for a reason let's run it and as you can see here it works and it's pretty efficient. I think if I ran it again, it might do better. Well, anyways, thanks for watching. Check out neatcode.io for a lot more, and I'll see you soon.